Welcome to News Cafe. I'm Mitzi Borromeo. Tonight, we're joined by veteran theater and film actress Monique Wilson. She is director of One Billion Rising, a worldwide movement to end violence against women. Monique, welcome to News Cafe. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Now, it's been two years mm -hmm. since you headed One Billion Rising. Tell us about this movement, how you got into it. First of all, I don't head one, but <laughs> you're the director, yeah. sorry, just, global uh, director. Within the movement, yeah. Right. Well, it's been amazing, like One Billion Rising, as you recall, last year was One Billion Rising for Justice. Yeah. That was our second year, and the first year was One Billion Rising. It was really a global call to end violence against women and girls. And in that first year, in uh, 2013, we, we were so overwhelmed by the response of 207 countries and yeah. thousands of rising events all around the world, which really kind of indicated how, how committed people are to ending violence against women and girls and what they were going to do to engage and contribute to ending that. So that was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So it became deeper in the second year in 2014 because then there was a theme and the theme was justice because of the rampant impunity that's yeah. going on all around the world which is escalating the violence and that so even more groups join and what we saw uh, last year or this year was really that the grassroots led it and there were really creative, audacious ways of expressing people's mm -hmm. indignation and people's, you know, um, intolerance already of, of the violence that's happening. Yeah. So, so, so this year, um, it's already going to escalate again into another theme because it's, it, it almost feels like an unstoppable energy. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, movements are like that. You know, you don't know if they're going to last or they're going to continue. And it's really so determined by the people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we saw this year is that there's a there's a raging cry to right. really to really address this issue and a metaphor that you've used a lot for this is dance this started yes. all with it there's a dance that i mean there's been flash mobs all around mm -hmm. and this is this symbolizes how the movement is really, it's, it's fired up and yes. it's growing because you know one billion rising really was born out of the v-day movement yes and the v-day movement was spearheaded by um, the playwright of the Vagina Monologues, Eve Ensler. So, so its core is always using art as activism. Right. And why art? Because art can really fire up people because it appeals to the emotions, it touches the heart. It's not an intellectual exercise. Right. And that's what we saw for many, many years with Vagina Monologues and V-Day. Yes. And when OBR was born out of that, One Billion Rising, it was very much the same energy. Like people responded to it viscerally, you know, right. not intellectually. Um, it, they responded with their emotions and with their spirits. And dance really became the catalyst to get people together. And you know, in the, the first year, nobody anywhere asked it in the second year, but the first year everybody asked like, why dance? Like, why dance? Like, you know, it, you're, you seem to be like advocating a very serious issue when dance doesn't feel like a serious action. And all of us would say, you know, first of all, when a woman is raped or battered or economically exploited when she becomes hungry and is forced to sell her body and, and all the forms of violence that are done to her, it's her body that gets caged, right? So it's her body that gets oppressed. So dance is such a, not just a symbolic, but a physical release of that, that encagement, that, 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 you know, something that's caging and oppressing her. So survivors all around the world danced mm -hmm. to really kind of gain their power back. But the second reason is also that dancing is alive. It's really a force and, and it's almost unstoppable. Like when people see it, it's like they feel drawn to it. Because yes. it's an amazing energy and it's collective. Right. It's not something you just do individually. You know, I think in this day and age now, we get so conditioned that it's very individualistic. It's me, me, me. Mm -hmm. But dance is such a collective action. Universal and in that language. collective energy, there's so much power there. Yeah. And, and, and really capacity to change things. Yeah. And what Eve Ensler said about this, she said, we've all learned to be so well behaved and polite, we should be hysterical. Yes. And she's saying absolutely. about this issue, we really yes. should speak up. Yes, yes. And, and really what, what it needs to be is that we need to express that rage. You know, right. when, when, because, you know, I think our biggest enemy um, with social injustices is apathy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think when you express your rage about things, or your yeah. celebration of things, yeah. then you're alive and you're connected and you have the ability to then touch other people as well. That's right. So I think that's the space we have to be in. Yeah, well, so much passion for this. No wonder you left your post in London. You were teaching <laughs> yes. for about five years when you had to leave mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. do this, to be here. Yeah, right. well, I chose, well, you know, teaching in London was like an amazing, amazing experience because, you know, of course, my past is is theater yeah. and it'll always live of course in the, the deepest part of my heart but 
you really come to a point in your life because I'm 44 years old now and I've been doing theater since I was nine you know so it's yeah. it's been a long journey yeah. and some sometimes you feel like okay what where do you want to bring this now where do you want to bring your experience where do you want to bring your 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 skills that that right. you've acquired all these years and how can it serve now mm -hmm. a much bigger thing than than yourself and teaching though international students for five years at E15 acting school which is quite a radical revolutionary theater school because yeah. our roots are very like radical theater as well mm -hmm. um, you know England is very known for that um, it also taught me a lot because you know when I was faced with like 35 international master's degree students every year for five years that's like having the world in your classroom yeah. the learning was so deep it was so rich and it gave me a glimpse of of humanity issues around the world right. because my students really represented that yeah. so I almost felt like that really prepared me for One Million Rising too. Well we'll talk about more on, on that now I just like to go back to your foray into theater now mm -hmm. you were acting since you were nine but you first got introduced to theater at three when you watched the um, <laughs> What yes. was it? The uh, Diary of Diary Frank. Frank. Yes. yes. And your mother had to stop you from climbing into the stage. <laughs> I know, I know. Do you remember that? Yes, I do, I do. You have a very long memory. It's a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was three, because my mother was very much into the theater, repertory Philippines, and um, you know her good friends were uh, Zenaida Mador and Baby Barredo, and, and so we would watch every opening night. And the first show my mother brought me to was Diary Van Frank. And, and I remember, I mean, I don't remember the story, but I remember that I wanted to climb on the stage <laughs> at the interval. But I did remember one thing. I just remember that it was about some injustice, something that didn't feel right. I guess when you're three years old, you know, what mm. possessed my mom to take me to Diary Van Frank at three years <laughs> at old? That also kind of says something about my mom. She's yeah. pretty radical too. Um, but I really fell in love with theater because I realized, oh my gosh, there's a, something live up there yeah. that we are now a part of. And that energy was just amazing. Of course, my mom had to peel me off <laughs> the stage at the interval. And then very soon after that, when, well, not soon, but when I was nine, um, she then enrolled me and my siblings in, in theater workshops in rep, and that's really where yeah. it started. And you were discovered, was at a birthday party you were seeing, that's where you were discovered by Zenaida <laughs> yes, Amador yes. and Baby Barredo. And yes. from there, all these leading roles came up for you. Yeah, huh? you know, I was very, I'm very grateful for all my years in repertory because, yeah. wow, what an amazing school it was. Yeah. Not just to learn theater, which we did, right. you know, really hands-on, um, but also about life. Yeah. You know, I mean, how, okay, I was nine, I was nine years old when I did Annie with Leia. Mm -hmm. She was Annie. And I replaced one of the kids. I was in the workshop. Actually, Leia was my classmate. And then one of the kids in the, origi the original cast, because I wasn't in the show yet, got sick. So I, I replaced her. And of course, I was really excited. It was, you know, <laughs> you're nine years old. It's like, it's like a, a, a show is like a playground. You yeah. know? It's, it's the most amazing thing. And you just have so much fun. And then the thing is, what I felt, though, was that you know, as I got older, of course, it became a profession. But I mean, nothing was kept from us in that space, you know. In many ways, I, I was really grateful for it. We were almost treated like adults, yeah. You know, I mean, the discussions we would have around issues of whatever stories we were telling on stage, you know, we as children, we mm -hmm. were engaged with that, and so it, so the the learning was so deep, and also the the maturing was so huge. Yeah. I mean, it was so much more than what one would get in school. Like, yeah, say, for example, true. where it's kind of rigid, uh -huh. you, know, the the, you know, the kind of education is so structured and rigid. Here it was open, it was, it was, it was, it was really, um, it was really like, in a way, very enriching mm -hmm. because you were just exposed to so many worlds and so many issues and stories from a very young age. And not just exposed, but you were like living it because you were acting it out on stage quite a fast way to grow up that way. Yeah, huh? yeah. You were expo you, well, you were training with two of our great pillars of theater, Bibi Barredo and Zenaida yes. what, what do you? What were the biggest things you got from them? What do you think you really learned from well, them? Well, you know, I really, the biggest thing I got from them was um, discipline. Hmm. Discipline. They were unrelenting. Yeah. Didn't They're matter scary. if we were nine <laughs> years old. Yeah. You know, you come on time, you know your lines, you've done your homework, you've done your work, right. and you be good and you be professional. Mm -hmm. There was no molly cuddling because we were children, right? And mm -hmm. I was really, really thankful for that. And they also threw a lot of um, challenges my way because I think in a way they sensed that kaya ko naman, I could, uh -oh. I could, you know, I, I, I could be up for that. You know, like for example, um, Tita Bibat Amador, she, she said, okay, you're teaching a summer theater workshop for kids. When I was 14, 
Like, I was oh 14. Gosh, I, I had age. taken workshops from 9 till I was 13. When I was 14, she said, okay, you're now going to be a teacher. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> like, you just don't say no. You, you just take it. You say, okay. Yeah. And then she assigned 52 children to me with no assistant. And from age 3 to 16, some of them were even you. older than me. So, I faced, faced resistance, you know, in the, in the classroom. I was like... But no, let's do this. And I had the most amazing time. I had the most amazing class. You know, I remember I directed Alice in Wonderland. It was my first directing wow. thing with students. And I'm like, and I loved it. I totally <laughs> loved it. So those kind of things I really owe to them because they just viewed you as somebody who, who had the ability. Yeah. They believed, they believed mm-hmm. so much in, in us. So it really, it really allowed us to spread our wings and fly and really jump into situations where I don't mm-hmm. think other young people you know, would have been given those opportunities. And they were very strict. Yes. And they were very, um, they were very clear, mm-hmm. you know, with, with us. Like, if you want to make this a profession, this is not something you're going to play around with. Yeah. You know, you commit, you commit. So I really right. learned discipline, commitment, dedication, professionalism, and also to be sturdy. Yeah. You know, they really told us the truth when we were not acting properly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, okay, I don't believe you. You know, you know, you need to just take it. So we didn't uh-huh. become overly sensitive about criticism we didn't become overly sensitive about you know like the truth and I think that those are really important things because it really I felt when I went to Miss Saigon all the way to when I stud- did my master's in school in London all the way when I put up New Voice Theatre Company and all mm-hmm. the way to One Billion Rising that sturdiness that foundation that fierceness you know that kind of like yeah. You, you just have to be strong. You have yeah. to be strong. Now let's talk about Miss Saigon, that confidence. So that's where that came from. At, at mm-hmm. 18, you, you, had to, you were in theater school. You mm-hmm. were at the, sorry, you were taking up theater in UP. Mm-hmm. And then uh, that's when Macint- Cameron McIntosh came here for the yes. auditions. What was that experience like? Now it's the 25th year, isn't yes. it? That 25th yes. anniversary oh of Miss Saigon. Yeah, I know. What was that experience you know what, like? It was, you know what, I think when you're 18 and you've been doing theater for you know, nine years, in my case, the, you know, the dream was to really keep doing theater, and either on Broadway or the West End, right? Yeah. And I think, and I'm sure Leah will agree with me also with this, it wasn't even about playing a lead role. It was just about the experience of, of being in another setting, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a place where historically theater has existed there for so, so long. Yeah. And the experience of being able to learn from that was really huge. And I think when you're 18, when, when I was auditioning, certainly, like... You, 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 you try your best and you, and you just do it, right? Mm-hmm. And in a way, I do remember my younger self just had no fears. In fact, now, now you already, <laughs> because you're grown up now, you have more fears. And then now when I fear certain things, like I have to go back to my 18-year-old self who was so fierce and so fearless, right? And, and I just remember that Miss Saigon was, it was such a big, big deal for us because mm-hmm. it was such an opportunity to learn. So when we actually went to London, when we got taken, me and Leigh got taken. Yeah. We were dancing on the streets in London and we were just so excited. We couldn't wait to come home and share it with everyone. And when we actually flew back with 13 other Filipinos to rehearse, you know, we had the time of our lives. I mean, we did. We had the time of our lives. And to me, what a dream that, that was, you know? Yeah. 19, and I'm going to ask you more about yeah. that dream because we need to take this quick break. When we return, we'll talk about Monique's new voice company and her life shuttling between Manila and London. This is News Cafe, and we have Monique Wilson at the table. All right, Monique, we were just talking about being in London. Now, yes. after the West End life, you mm-hmm. came back to the Philippines. That was about after three years, and then yes. suddenly you got into film. Yes. In one year, you did so many films. Yes. You had your own album. You got mm-hmm. into TV. What it was, was a that culture like? shock. <laughs> yeah. Culture shock. Because, you know, I, my whole life I'd been in theater, and three years I was in the West End with Miss Saigon, and there's a certain standard of working that you get used to in theater. It's very disciplined. It's very exact. Um, and then when I forayed into um, local films here in the Philippines and TV, it was also an amazing year, I have to say. But it really 
open my eyes to how difficult the industry is yeah. also like in the other mediums, right? But I, again, I learned so much and I'm so grateful for all those earlier um, experiences because again, it challenged me in a particular way. And mm. I think also that's where, actually it, it, hap it began now probably also in Miss Saigon, like the seeds of activism mm. were starting to grow, you yeah. know, because I guess when you're 18, 19, 20, you don't really have language for it. You don't have, because even when I was doing Miss Saigon, I was thinking, you know, a lot of people in England were telling me, no, you're too strong. You're playing Kim too strong as an Asian woman. I'm like, but Asian women are strong, yeah. you know, like. They stereotype. So, yeah, so I fought for that, you know, and things mm -hmm. like that. But of course, you don't see that as activism. You just see it as maybe you're just finding your voice, you know. So when I came back also here for films, the same thing was happening. Like, I guess there's inherent things in you that feel like this is a bit demeaning for women or this is a bit, you know, not respectful to women, you know, just things like, okay, you have to wear bikinis in the in the in the film so yeah. that we see your body i'm like yeah that doesn't feel Why? right yeah. you know that doesn't feel right oh but you have a wet look so we also see your body in the scene i'm like well, but it's not necessary for the story you know and yeah. I'm, I'm in no way prudish yeah. but you know you kind of i began to you get were very a sense, aware at that yeah time. i began to get a sense that you know we need to kind of stick up for ourselves as mm -hmm. female actresses and that emerged slowly mm -hmm. but those years of course were, were very eye-opening for me because i also saw particular challenges in those fields yeah well i'd like to mention some of the films like bad boy 2 you were nominated <laughs> for philippine star awards as the best newcomer at the time yeah Kapag iginuhit ang hatol ng puso. So this is the Philippine Academy of the Philippines Best Supporting Actress Awardee. Out of all the films, is there one that stands out for you particularly that you really I think, you know, um, I really enjoyed doing Rizal with mm. the late direct Mario yeah. Diaz Abaya. Yeah. Prior to that, I had been with a lot of male directors who were all yeah. lovely and taught me a lot. They also taught me a lot. But I just felt, I don't know, I felt safer in the hands of a woman director. And I just felt that the, there was a healthy respect and consciousness about what women actresses go through. Yeah. And when I was doing uh, Rizal, I played Maria Clara, she was very like, you know, she really got me into the process of, okay, this is what happens on a film set, you know, this is mm -hmm. where, this is where the camera is going to be, this is where it's going to be the angle. You know, she was yeah. so mindful that as women, we feel vulnerable in front of a camera because, you know, we're kind of just laid bare there. Mm -hmm. And to think Maria Clara was not even like a sexy role in yeah. any way. Whereas the previous roles that I was given were kind of sexy parts. I guess maybe people thought that since I was doing Miss Saigon in a bikini that it's okay for you to wear a bikini all the time put you in, this in box. a film. Yeah. And it's like, of course it isn't because it kind of feels exploitative in a way, yeah. you know. But yeah. but I really felt safe in her hands and, you know, and, and I think she's a brilliant director and I think that kind of revived my love for film as well mm -hmm. because there was, a, there was really a moment where I felt I don't want to do films anymore. I'm always having to like I'm always having to like fight for my uh -huh. rights like on the set. Like uh -huh. I don't want to take off my robe. I don't want to take off my clothes. Right. You know, and, and I think for women to have to go through that all the time yes. on a film set is really yeah. like pressurizing and very stressful yeah. because it's like you should be in a safe environment also if you're an artist, yeah. especially if you're if you're doing particular stories, you know, so I, I really give that to direct Marilu that mm -hmm. she, she revived my love for film and, mm -hmm. and, you know, because I was almost slowly turning away from it. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that in the Philippines, uh, well, now it's, it's happening all over the world, that women really do tend to be objectified in film, mm -hmm. you know, and it's happening in media and magazines yes, a lot. Absolutely. It's happening more now. No doubt about mm -hmm. it. Everywhere. Not just the Philippines, it's everywhere in the world. Yeah. Like a woman is so commodified. Yes. And she's sexualized also. Mm -hmm. She's fetishized. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like she's there as a product or an mm -hmm. object of desire, you yeah. know, or beauty or sexuality. And not that that would be a bad thing, but if that's the only thing that mm -hmm. you're selling her as, then yeah. there, there is something wrong with that commodification because a woman is so much more than that. And, yeah. that, and that, you know, to box her or to commodify her leads to other things, mm -hmm. you know, other forms of exploitation and abuse as we see socially right you know there's trafficking there's prostitution and there's so many other but it all starts there isn't it like when we pick up a magazine and how do we view this woman yeah right yes. and then we wonder why you know men or a patriarchal structure in our societies kind of treat her in a certain way the church does the same thing mm -hmm. you know it kind of it's just such a such a hold on our view of women when in fact why should we emulate you know you know what whatever the church has, has told us we need to be pious obedient virginal 
you know, that's not anymore what a, mm -hmm. what a modern Filipina is right. or a modern woman is. No, that's why it's very important to be media literate to also know what's yes. being said to us. Yes. And absolutely. this is the beauty of the New Voice Company. This is what you were trying to do with your company, to really, it, was, it wasn't just your ordinary theater company. It was a form mm -hmm. of acti activism mm -hmm. for you, wasn't it? I think when I was growing up in repertory, I was so, you know, I, was, I had so much fun doing the Rodgers and Hammerstein, you know, musicals, the Neil Simon comedies. You know, I learned so much from that too, right? But when I did Miss Saigon, that was a whole other space. But I think when I was in London, my, my social and political education there exposed me to so many different kinds of theater. Mm -hmm. And so my dream was to go back home and put up a theater company that was different, different from um, what I had experienced and different from what was going on here at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's many you know, kind of progressive radical theater groups, which is great. And basically, my dream for New Voice was to really do theater that was politically um, provocative mm -hmm. and socially provocative and to use theater as a means to awaken and inspire and educate and incite audiences to really think about their lives and, you know, um, engage yeah. with, with social issues. Right. And it was very tough in the beginning because, of course, it's not you commercial. Were new. Yeah, yeah. It's not commercial. We were new. It was, it was very radical, you know, to do right. things like... Angels in America. Yeah, the vagina monologues. The vagina in monologues. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And vagina yeah. monologues came a bit later, but yeah. all those had challenges, particularly vagina monologues, because I soon realized, you know, that anything about women's sexuality was so taboo, and people were so right. fearful of it. But it was such a mega hit, you know. Yeah. And year after year after year, we we did it because then you see, you know, that's what I also believed in as a producer or an artistic artistic director that we can't underestimate. Our audiences so I never bought in those early years you know some people telling me the Filipino audience won't be able to understand that so mm. just produce this kind of show and I'm like right no absolutely not I, I totally agree. believe in the Filipino you know yes. we have such capacity to understand things to to accept and to also um to appreciate mm -hmm. many forms of theater and many forms of art and why should we um, edit that or be biased yeah. about it. Just, you know, let them decide whether right. they want. And we saw it with Vagina Monologues. We had no sponsors. We had no support. And yet, the audiences were lining up each night. And that's the real, that's real theater. And you even <laughs> translated it to Philippines. Yes, and we took it all over the Philippines and, and all our migrants. Right, to other abroad. countries because the New Voice Company has become very successful in mm -hmm. Asia. You've also been active in Hong Kong, yes. Japan, Singapore. Mm -hmm. How would you compare the different cultures of theater here in Southeast Asia compared to um, the Philippines? It's, it's all very interesting, you know, because it, it, you know, when we brought, for example, Vagina Monologues to Singapore, it was actually here. See, we had no censor censorship here. Like, you know, we did hear from some church quarters saying that this is not, this is immoral, but nobody will come and close you down, right? Mm. I mean, they might pick it outside, but they won't close you down. Yeah. But in Singapore, the government itself was like um, saying it, this might be blasphemous and we're not going to give you a license to like perform it. Yeah. So I had to really negotiate with the Arts Council <laughs> there, saying that, you know, this is really a great play to empower women. And, but in the first year we did it in Singapore, they said, okay, 21 years old and above. And I'm like, 21? We mm -hmm. have to empower the girls when they're younger. But it was a negotiation. I had to yeah. compromise. Second year, it became 18. Third year, it became 16. Fourth year, 13-year-olds could watch Na Vagina Monologues in Singapore. So you also have to do it slowly. Yeah. Japan was very tough for Vagina yeah, Monologues because that? It, it, you know, they don't really speak up. No, about there. women's issues. So that had yeah. different challenges. But you yeah. know, in artistic spaces, you see, you also find like-minded, radical, yeah. um, artistic people who will also help you push your vision forward. Right. And in, um, was it 2008 when um, you did the V-Day, that was in New Orleans? Yeah, that was the 10th anniversary of V-Day. 10th v anniversary, and that was amazing because there were four of you speaking in different languages, yeah. saying yes. vagina in, yes. in your language, yes. Yes. and you were screaming. That was, it was very liberating, it seemed. You were yeah. jumping on stage. Yeah, you know, because that monologue is really to, to reclaim all the negative connotations yeah. you've given to the word vagina, and it's such a, and this is where theater is so powerful, and we saw yeah. it every year. With, we're still seeing it now with yeah. vagina. A monologue it's like it really allows people to express it shatters all the taboos and the silence surrounding issues that we actually need to talk about and it's really the self-empowerment that happens is so immense I mean that has been my journey right you know like I don't know if I was I mean of course I look at myself as a child and I'm sure I was pretty courageous and fierce but not in certain ways but vagina, producing and performing vagina monologues gave me courage in other ways yeah that I could bring now to political spaces, mm -hmm. you know, to other spaces, to really kind of 
um, be vanguard of change in other places, even when it feels so scary. Because that personal empowerment as a woman that I got from the play is really is the fire that allows me the courage to to go to new spaces yes. and to really to risk. Right. Because I don't think you can be an artist who doesn't risk. Right. <laughs> like you, that's part of our job. You know, we have to. And then of yeah. course. If you blend activism with that, then you know you can bring your art into activism and risk in the same way that you did as an artist. Right. Well, we'll look into other risks you've taken <laughs> later on. Time to take another quick break. When we return, we'll talk about more milestones in Monique's very colorful life. Stay tuned. <laughs> You're watching News Cafe as we get into the mind of Monique Wilson. All right, Monique, we were just talking about V-Day and all mm -hmm. the offshoots that it's mm -hmm. had. Another aspect of this was the male voice. Yes. So not to put up the men aside, no? Mm -hmm. A part of all of these movements with V-Day is also to bring the men into the discussion. Yes, you know, in 2003, you know, when we did a V-Day in 2003, Eve Ensler, she had posed this thinking to us, you know, like, what, like, if you're a girl, like, what would a future without violence look like? Right? So that's kind of what we women were thinking of. It's a question she gave us in that particular V-Day year. But for the men, this is the question she posed, like, what are your roots of violence? And what, and what did that do to you? And what would you now want to change from that? Because I think in all our years of advocating for, you know, for women's rights, you know, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a clear realization that happens that you cannot just empower the women. They speak up. They then know their rights. They then fight for it when the issue that men are still doing violent actions is still existing. Yeah. So the, the consciousness changing has to happen in both, you know, the empowerment for the women to not take the violence, but also for the men to address mm -hmm. why they are prone to violence, why they feel it's normal to do it, or why they feel it's permissible to just hit a woman or to degrade her, right? right. So we had like a very interesting V-Day production where, you know, the men wrote their own monologue and then the women wrote their own monologue. And we got really inspired from that in New Voice. So we, with Rito Asilo, who, who wrote the play, The Male Voice, we, we also realized, why don't let's interview men and really ask that question, like, what have been your roots of violence? And, and what do you feel about it? And what would you like to change? And that came about, the play came about from that. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. very successful. Again, it was very, I think it was, you know, it's always scary to kind of open up those things because, you know, somehow men don't want to talk about their emotions and it, right. to them it's a very different space also. But we had amazing actors who did it and who also risked, you know, who also opened themselves up. And we also had, you know, men who were willing to tell us their stories that yeah. we could then bring into a play. So I think those kind of initiatives we would still love to develop. You know, and, and we very much tied into One Million Rising now yeah. because we saw a lot of men rising all yeah. over the world. So this year we even have a Men Rising initiative yeah. already. Yeah. Well, wonderful, very provocative indeed. Yes. Now, another provocative role you played was in the play My Name is Rachel Corey. In 2010, that's how mm -hmm. you celebrated your 30th yes. year in theater. Yes. And you said this was really a very moving experience mm -hmm. for you. Why? You know, when I was teaching in East 15 Acting School, I had, a, I had a Palestinian student. And again, you know, it's one of these issues that you, you read about Israel and Palestine all yeah. the time. Yeah. And then you, you, you kind of know there's a lot of injustice there, but you don't know a lot of the other layered stories and why the injustice is even happening, um, you know, in the involvement of the U.S. and because they fund Israel. And when I had my student, Bayan, in my class, her name was Bayan, she just became such a human face to the mm -hmm. story. She was a refugee. You know, she had so many personal stories that, you know, in, in an acting space, you, you share so much and yeah. it, you become really close. It's quite an intimate space and the trust is so deep. And she inspired me so much to really go further into, you know, learning what those issues are. Because, you know, I always feel with theater and with the world, especially with One Billion Rising now, I just feel like we cannot just stay with our issues. What are our issues in the Philippines, you know? Like, the Palestinian issue is our issue, you know? Mm. The issues of human trafficking around the world are our issues. Why, why are we always separating? Mm -hmm. I think if you're, you're a human being, that's, you should be involved. That's, yeah. It's your task to know, to get educated. So I went to Palestine 
you know, um, and I, you know, I was with Bayan, she took me around, and when you see firsthand the, the total apartheid scenario there of um, just the, 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 the racial, the discrimination it's against a race of people, yeah. it's really heartbreaking, mm. and the, oppre the severe oppression. So I decided I must do my name is Rachel Corey, which is a play about this American young activist who goes to Gaza. She gets yeah. killed. She gets bulldozed by um, an Israeli, uh, you know, bulldozer. Yeah. And it's about her life. She, you know, she kept a diary. And I just feel like, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge political activist. Although I probably I'm becoming more and more now. But, you know, I think in our spaces where we have experience, like theater, it's, it almost becomes an obligation and a responsibility mm. to to show those stories as, as much as we possibly can. Right. And everybody asked me when I did, my name is Rachel Corey, like, why don't you just do a concert? It's your 30th anniversary. I'm like, no. Like, That's not you. <laughs> no, no, what's more burning now in your heart is like to tell these stories. And then yeah. they said, why Palestine? And then of course, you know what we realized? That we were part of the decision making in 1947 at the UN, you know, like our yeah. Philippine president and we abstained Imagine from, that. you know, so it's like, we, we contributed. Have a yeah. We contribute, and now when we go to Jerusalem, for example, as pilgrims, because we're Christians and Catholics, yeah. and we go there just because of that, and not see the oppression happening right mm -hmm. there, then we become just as culpable as right. the perpetrators. So that, I mean, that to me, that's a really a big belief of mine. That's why I think theater really has a, as we saw with the monologues, it has a capacity to change. Why? Because you are provoking people to think about an issue. Exactly. And, and we cannot underestimate that. Now, in terms of even the women you admire, this is a characteristic you seem to look in for that. For example, Vanessa Redgrave, mm -hmm. she's one of your heroines, you've yes, said. I she's also her. an activist. Why do you like her? What else is, is about her that you really you like? You know, again, again I th you know, when I go to, back to my childhood, I, f I find many traces of you know, where I stand today. Because I loved, loved, loved Vanessa Redgrave and Jane Fonda in the mm. film Julia. And I yeah. saw it when I was seven years old. I mean, who watches the film? Again, my mother took me to see it. Like, who watches the film Julia about political activists? You were molded at a when very When you're like age. seven years old. And it wasn't maybe a coincidence that many years later, I met Vanessa Redgrave in London when I was doing Miss Saigon because, you know, I was so... I was, I was very audacious, you know. I mm. wrote her a letter. I was doing Miss Saigon. Down the road, she was doing a play in the Excellent. West End. Yeah. And I said, dear Miss Redgrave, I'm such a big fan of yours because I really want to be a political activist. And I want to be an actress like you and a political <laughs> activist. You know, when you're so young, you yeah. just, it's like a four-page letter. Mm -hmm. And she was like, she, she must have liked the letter or she must have thought, who's I'm this sure. kid, right? And I said, I'm performing down the road from you in a musical <laughs> Miss Saigon. And then you know what she did like a few weeks later? She invited me to do a fundraising concert wow. for the International House of Orphans for her. So I met her. We worked together. And to Amazing. me, it was like a dream come true because it's like this woman who I had admired yeah. since, a, since a child. And you know what I love about her is because she really is not going to compromise her political beliefs mm -hmm. for what she thinks her image as an actor is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, re that's really fierceness. That's because yes, for a while she was actually oh, yeah. put aside because I mean, of to, her. I mean, to, to relate it back to Israel, you know, yeah. like when she won the Academy Award, she said something about Zionism and right. all of Hollywood black, uh, you know, black, I mean, blacklisted her. That's she right. couldn't work. And yet, she's such an astounding actress that yeah. she never stopped working, even yeah. when she was blacklisted. That's because, right. you know, you really cannot hide that kind of a light. Exactly. You cannot. And it was no coincidence also, I think, that Many years later, I also met Jane Fonda, who's our board member of V-Day. Yes, an esteemed, that. loved board member of ours at V-Day, who, who performed, we performed together in New Orleans in that same mm -hmm. V-Day Vagina Monologue show, and who I've met on many, many occasions, who's now, you know, a, a great friend, and, you know, we work together in V-Day. And it's like, and I think some of these synergies and energies just really connect when I think your, your inner core or your inner beliefs, you know, do... Yeah. Um, are, are, are in tangent with each other. I think. Well, your life is proof that when you really want something and you work hard for it, things just happen. Yes, I think yeah. so. That's I mean, you believe also in, when you believe strongly in particular things. Exactly, well. no yeah. fear. Now, another, in 2012, um, you also, actually, this is a time that you came out. Mm -hmm. This is when you spoke openly yeah. about being gay. And, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they see a beautiful woman come out, they say, Sayang. You know, know, you're actually crazy, crazy like a reaction. <laughs> I know. And we seem to be more familiar here with the male mm -hmm. aspect of mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. gay. Yeah. What was that experience like for you? You know, that was the first year of One Beyond Rising, right? And I remember that year I was doing King and I, the musical. 
and I was not yet the global director, but I was coordinating one billion rising here. That was already many years in Gabriela. And at that moment, I just thought, you know what? How can we do one billion rising? Encourage people to speak the truth. You know, encourage them to 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 stand up for who they were and you know what they felt. When I myself had not ever come out, not that I ever felt I needed to. You know, I mean. You know, I've been gay for a long, long, long time, and I was in a very, still am in a very yeah. long, you know, um, committed relationship. But when in my early years in film and TV and theater, I also felt I didn't want to eclipse the political and social activism mm-hmm. work in theater that I was doing, because my fear at that time was not that you would be out, yeah. but that nobody will talk about the issues of vagina monologues or right. whatever we're doing in theater because they're only going to focus on your sexuality, which yeah. is, was kind of the norm. So I also felt, but I also never lied about it. You mm-hmm. know, like when people would ask me or hint, I just would not say anything, but I also never denied because I think to yeah. deny is also to, to not be truthful to yourself. I just felt very strongly that, you know, this is a private life and this is the public and the public life has to really come into its own first, mm-hmm. especially when you're doing political work. Yeah. And, and in fairness to all, all, all the media, I have to say, they never intruded, mm-hmm. even, the, even the showbiz media, mm-hmm. you know, and it's their job to intrude, like they never did. They almost kind of felt that I was gay, but since I never denied it, I felt very much that they respected me and then they never intruded. But in the year of the one, first year of One Bear I thought, I'm going to say this because actually you look at that sector, I keep, you know, I, all my life it's been in the women's, women's movement, right? But the LGBT sector here, you know, it's so marginalized. That's right. No rights. You know, there's so many huge forms of discrimination there. And I just think, gosh, there's no, you as a, as a gay person, why wouldn't you just be able to, to say, you know, and to, 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 to be able to speak up also exactly. about it. Exactly, you need a it. voice. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I was really glad I did. And you know what, <laughs> all the press were like said, We've always known, so it's such, so not <laughs> really a big no deal. big deal. So not a big deal. And I also thought, well, this is really a maturing already, also for yes. society. It's a maturing also of, of the acceptance of it. But there's so much to do then in that sector, mm-hmm. Talaga. And I also felt that in OBR, One Billion Rising the first year, so many LGBT sectors rose. Yeah. They rose. And you know what they were telling me, even prior to coming out, and even more so when I came out, they said, you know what? We as a sector, we need to learn so much from the women's movement. Because yeah. the women's movement have paved the way, paved the way in terms of activism. And we want to learn from that activism because now we really have to act, uh, you know, also advocate for LGBT rights. Yeah. So it was, it was such a, a loving um, like process. Yes, yes. And, and I, I didn't get any of, I think, what other people may have experienced, right. you know, a certain backlash. Mm-hmm. Totally not at all. It, it, mm-hmm. it was so not um, an issue. Yeah. And, and I felt like, Grateful for that too. Yeah. You know, it didn't eclipse the work of one been rising yeah. and, and well, it's still just... so many inspiring stories to share, but time for another break. When we come back, we'll talk about Monique's advocacies. I am rising for every woman I love, all my sisters who know of the pain that stays and lingers after wounds have healed and the scars don't show. I am rising, we are rising. In every corner of the earth, one billion people rising. And our voice will be heard. I am rising for every woman on earth who cries herself to sleep who thinks she's been forgotten in the darkness where she weeps my nights are not of slumber for my sister's heart i hear and i ask the wind to bring her a promise of a world without any fear i am rising we are rising in every corner of the earth one billion people rising and our song will be
This is News Cafe, and we are talking to Monique Wilson. All right, Monique, we were just talking about very important milestones in your mm -hmm. life. Now, also in 2012, you talked about your health. Now, mm -hmm. you, you had blood cancer yeah. in, was it 2010 that you mm -hmm. were diagnosed? Yes, yes. And so much has happened. You said when you were faced with your mortality, your mm -hmm. perspective on life just changed. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I still have it now. It's a chronic illness, yeah. blood cancer, but I'm very, again, I'm very blessed to, you know, have... Uh, access to medicine and healthcare, yeah. and this is really what also fuels my activism in so many ways because you yeah. just re every day you're reminded especially when you're facing a chronic illness that you are privileged mm. and you are so lucky and the gratitude you have is so deep that you must you must look at what what's outside yeah. and, and 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 this is really what kind of fuels me in my activism because it's like you know I was given a second lease on life definitely yeah. Your, your perspective does change when you're facing a chronic illness and mm -hmm. you don't want to waste any more time. You know, right. you don't want to waste time with things that don't matter anymore mm -hmm. or things that, like, like even now, like negative energy or people, I really walk away from it because I just feel like it's toxic. I don't want to be in those spaces because there's so much to do, so much you can contribute to society. And there's so many, like even our own Kababayans, our own Filipinos, I mean, they have no access to any of these kind of things. They don't have such luxury or privilege and yet they serve they mm -hmm. serve continuously and that, that to me is the most humbling and I really, that's why to me, I follow in their example. Mm -hmm. I learn from them. They give me the political and social education because to me, that's, that's really what being alive is, you know? Right. It's not even thinking of yourself, it's really serving. So, so to me, okay, some days, you know, of course you have side effects and stuff, but mm. you know, I'm not even going to complain about it because it's like... You know, I'm lucky. I'm really lucky. Living life to the fullest. So inspiring. Now, you joined Gabriella. You mm -hmm. are a director of international affairs of the Gabriella Women's Party. Mm -hmm. You have always said that you've been so inspired by these women. I mean, they, yes, they have really brought you, know, you to tears. Because yes, of what my Gabriella sisters are, you know, the, the life and heart of my soul. I really believe that. You know, when in 99, they invited me to be the, the international spokesperson for the Purple Rose campaign against sex trafficking of Filipinas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that really began my long relationship with them. That's why in 2000, when we did the Vagina Monologues, I also knew, as a theater actress, and not so educated yet on women's issues, like I could not produce the play without mm -hmm. them as partners because they're the ones who've been doing the advocacy work for decades yeah. in this country. And they know the context. So we've had a... We've had, what, a 15-year um, partnership now with Vagina Monologues, V-Day, and mm -hmm. um, with Gabriela. And, of course, now with One Billion Rising, they're really leading the campaigns nationally and internationally with our um, migrant groups. But also, I feel that, you know, they are such real people, fierce women, yeah. courageous, who, again, as I said earlier, just, you know, they, they serve. They serve yeah. the people to its fullest capacity with no, absolutely no help from the government. I need to stress that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in fact, it's the government sometimes that they have to go against. I mean, mostly. Because, you know, a lot of our violence, as I myself have learned in all my years with Gabriela, and particularly with One Billion Rising, where I've, Gabriela sisters have brought me to communities all around the country, that, you know, a lot of the violence is state instigated, you know, mm -hmm. it's the neglect, the severe neglect from our government that really doesn't allow our women to thrive, that exploits them, that keeps yeah. them in hunger and abuse. So, you know, we have to call the perpetrators, that's what Gabriela have taught me too, like, you know, we have to call the perpetrators out, mm -hmm. you know, not because we're always wanting to go against the government, it's not about that, but because, yeah. you know, we can't allow this kind of impunity exactly. to go on because you're serving the people, you're not serving the government, you know, it's the mm -hmm. other way around. And, and you need to be with the people. That's why earlier, you know, you know a, a Gabriela sister of mine said, you know, you cannot lead movements. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the best thing she told me. It's the most humbling reminder of who you are and what you're doing. Like she said to me, you cannot lead movements, you have to be inside it. Mm. You have to be with the people, you have to listen to them, you have to know their stories. Yeah. And you can become, and you, can become you know, somebody who can then bring the stories on another platform through my art, for example. Yeah. You know, so, so that really has been a huge gift to me. Yes. You know, I mean, another gift. example of this is you were also very active in Lila Filipina. Mm -hmm. These are the comfort women. And until now, they really have not received any kind of compensation. No, no. and yet, and look happened. at what our Lolas, our comfort yes. women Lolas, you know what they're advocating now? It's not even for their rights anymore. It's for the rights of our young Filipinas who are getting sex trafficked. Right. You can imagine the generosity of that. Like, to no longer think of your own mm -hmm. um, stories exactly. and advocacy. Now, you just want to make sure there's a justice so that right. the younger women now don't get trafficked. And you know, the trafficking that happens to our Filipinas is one of our worst, most mm -hmm. endemic yeah. um, 
And you know, and now with the coming in of the U.S. troops in this country, you know, we have proliferation of brothels and prostitution and trafficking. So we have a lot of issues we need to address here that we need to to stand with. That's why sometimes I tell my artist friends, you know what? We have a place also. You yeah. know, okay, we're not as we're not as good as our you know as the other activists who really can mobilize yeah. and 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 energize you know people, but. You know we can we can sing in rallies. Yeah. You know we can talk about it when we're facing the media. We can be in solidarity with the right. people, and and that there's a you use know, this the, medium. You can you mm -hmm. can still contribute. No, yeah. in there not there are no small ways of contributing. Yeah. And this is why you use theater as empowerment. Yes, also, you definitely. do this with some migrant communities. Mm -hmm. how, how has the reception been like? Because you've worked not just with um, in communities in the Philippines, but also in other countries. You know it's been amazing because art is really such a catalyst, as we've yeah. seen with One Billion Rising. Mm -hmm. It's such a catalyst for awakening mm -hmm. and once somebody is awakened there's no turning back mm -hmm. you know it's like what Rachel Corey says in the play <clears throat> you know once you're awake you can never go back to sleep yeah and I think that's really what you know what being alive to the world is yeah and you also once said you know you talked about how we complain about the state of our government or yeah. country but you always say do not blame the people before us the yeah. generation now has to do something about the problems. Yes, because it's your future too. And I was telling you earlier mm. that the One Billion Rising, the most astounding aspect of it last year was the youth rising all yeah. around the world. Yeah. Wow, it was phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, you know that the women's groups are going to be in One Billion Rising and the women's movement, but the youth mm -hmm. who came into the, to the campaign so fiercely and radical, radically mm -hmm. artistic, creative, audacious, fearless, and the Philippines, wow. I still need to get my head around like the young people and their risings in this country and yeah. what they were rising for. They were rising for like social justice issues. They were rising for tuition fee hikes. They were mm -hmm. rising to say no to prostitution to pay for tuition because mm -hmm. apparently in so many you know poorer communities, yeah. the girls are being sold their bodies just to pay tuition, just right. to be able to go to school. And so the young people of all classes we're saying no. Education is a right, not a privilege, and they mm -hmm. rose for that. And to me, it was it was so inspiring. It's so, wonderful so inspiring. to see that the youth do have a voice, and they're doing something yeah, about it. and they're it. insisting on their future. Exactly. And they're energetic and loud about it. They no, there's really the hope. Minority. There's really hope. Yes. And another issue you've also been very um, su supportive of is the International Migrants Tribunal. So you were helping the Global Forum on Migration and Development mm -hmm. also, as well as you were a judge recently at the Gawad Agong para sa pamamahayag. So you've yeah. been working with indigenous people too. Yeah, and I think One Billion Rising, I think what it's brought us is really connection to so many different um, movements. Right. You know, the indigenous, our indigenous people have yeah. so many issues here because land is being taken away from them. There's so much mining, large-scale mining going on, and they're getting displaced. And the general public don't know about these things, you know, and I wouldn't know either until Gabriela took me to the communities. And for our migrants, for example, I mean, you know, sometimes we hear our president saying, oh, when we have... Uh, this X amount of migrants going abroad, that's a sign of success. Mm -hmm. You know, he said that in his sauna, right? Yeah. And we're like, that's not a sign of success. Who Filipino wants to leave the country, be forced to migrate and get exploited abroad in other labor practices as domestic workers and leave their family for years and not mm -hmm. see their children grow up? That right. is not a sign of success. So, you know, it's like we have to really rethink these kind mm -hmm. of things that are being fed to us by both, you know, the media and the government and really fight against, arise against it. Yeah. You have done so much, Monique, and I can't help but, you know, talking to you, see these parallelisms with Eve Ensler's life. So the playwright, <laughs> yes, I mean, she had likely, cancer yes. too, yes. such an inspiring woman activist. Yes. I mean, now 34 years in theater, mm -hmm. still doing so much. What, what, what is next for Monique Wilson? What, what are you looking at now? Well, our, our, our next um, call now for One Billion Rising, I mean, my life now is One Billion Rising. You know, I think it's such, a, such an amazing um, movement that I'm so, so again, privileged to be, you know, such a part of and to have a global perspective of the risings that are happening around the world and to meet the most amazing activists mm -hmm. you know there are equivalents of Gabriella like in mm -hmm. so many countries around the world and that just kind of you know on the one hand you feel grief and sorrow and rage at all the injustices happening all around the world mainly instigated by a lot of Western countries with their neoliberal policies that really affect the poor developing countries mm -hmm. but on the one hand you also see amazing activists both in the Western countries and in the right. global South countries who are devoting their lives to really changing the world for you know for the the oppressed and the poor communities around the world so you kind of feel like you feel rage and joy and grief and sorrow on the one hand yes. and on the one hand you just feel such inspiration that you would never get anywhere you would it's never not get hopeless. the kind of, no yeah. it's not hopeless so i really 
I'm so excited for this year, which is, you know, One Billion Rising, and our theme this year is revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, last year it was One Billion Rising for Justice, this year is One Billion Rising for Revolution. And how we came about that is that we gathered 35 of our One Billion Rising coordinators in Rome last April, mm -hmm. you know, to really kind of assess and analyze what the risings were. And what we really came up with as an analysis is that the grassroots are fiercely in the lead, you know, mm -hmm. because the most marginalized really suffer the most everywhere in the world whether it's in the West or in the South. And, yeah. and, and what One Billion Rising did was really give us a global solidarity. Yeah. That we, we could now work in our advocacies locally because we could feel strength with solidarity that's coming from around the world. And yeah. that was the beauty of One Billion Rising. And also harnessing our creativity for mm -hmm. more radical actions yes. to really further our advocacy because right. the, the art is such a powerful tool weapon yeah, in a way yeah. because it really right. opens people's minds so when we when we say revolution you know people ask me what does that mean revolution you know what it really means globally it, it means that it's a radical shift in consciousness mm -hmm. and when you say radical shift that means you have to take in the, the urgency of the issues right. which means we can no longer wait you know we have justice calls of last year now we are still going to demand our, our justice calls but we need to find more radical creative, audacious yes. ways of changing people's mindsets. Because, you know, it's, it's that once people's mindsets are changed, they will actively join. And here in the Philippines, of course, our call for revolution is really system change. Mm -hmm. system. Yeah. You can't have justice on particular issues, but the system has not changed. Yes. So, you know, the other day mm -hmm. we, had our, we had our launch already for One Billion Rising, and um, Gabriela is leading it, but we have a whole task force group with, made up of our workers, our migrants, teachers, students, mm -hmm. um, children's groups, you know, yeah. um, and our call is really women rising against corruption. Right. Because really what we're sussing out now is that unless you change the system that's governing us, mm -hmm. you're never gonna, you're, you're never gonna get justice for women because it's the system that's keeping the violence yeah. in place. Well, Monique, thank you for being so revolutionary and bringing <laughs> it back. I mean, you. you could have chosen to stay away. You were living in London, you were in Singapore, and now you've chosen to come back to give back and really help the country. But thank you also for giving us the space to talk about these revolutionary actions because, you know, we all need to work hand in hand to make the revolution happen. Well, wonderful having you and hope to have you again. Thank you. And that's your News Cafe tonight. See you next Thursday for another delectable Mind Brew. Thank you again, Monique Wilson, for being here Thank tonight. Thank you so much. I'm Mitzi Borromeo. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Somewhere beyond the barricade Is there a world you long to see? Do you hear the people sing? Say, do you hear the distant drums? It is the future that we bring when tomorrow comes. Will you give all you can give So that our banners may advance? Some will fall and some will live Will you stand up and take your chance? The blood of the martyrs will water our meadows and lands. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Somewhere beyond the barricade Is there a world you long to see? Do you hear the people sing? Say, do you hear the distant drums? It is the future that we bring when tomorrow comes. Welcome to News Cafe, I'm Mitzi Borromeo. 
Tonight, we're joined by veteran theater and film actress Monique Wilson. She is director of One Billion Rising, a worldwide movement to end violence against women. Monique, welcome to News Cafe. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Now, it's been two years mm -hmm. since you headed One Billion Rising. Tell us about this movement, how you got into it. First of all, I don't head one. But <laughs> You're the director, yeah. sorry. Just, Global uh, director. Within the movement, yeah. Right. Well, it's been amazing. Like, One Billion Rising, as you recall, last year was One Billion Rising for Justice. Yeah. That was our second year, and the first year was One Billion Rising. It was really a global cult, and we're going to continue. And it's really so determined by the people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we saw this year, is that there's a, there's a raging cry to, right. really, to really address this issue. And a metaphor that you've used a lot for this is dance. This started yes. all with it. There's a dance that, I mean, there's been flash mobs all around. Mm -hmm. And this is, this symbolizes how the movement is, really, it's, it's fired up and yes. it's growing. Because, you know, One Billion Rising really was born out of the V-Day movement. Yes. And the V-Day movement was spearheaded by um, the playwright of the Vagina Monologues, Eve Ensler. So, so its core is always using art as activism. Right. And why art? Because art can really fire up people because it appeals to the emotions, it touches the heart. It's not an intellectual exercise. Right. And that's what we saw for many, many years with Vagina Monologues and V-Day. Yes. And when OBR was born out of that, One Billion Rising, it was very much the same energy. Like people responded to it viscerally, you know, right. not intellectually. Um, it, they responded with their emotions and with their spirits. And dance really became the catalyst to get people together. And, you know, in the, the first year, nobody anywhere asked it in violence against women and girls. And in that first year, in uh, 2013, we, we were so overwhelmed by the response of 207 countries and yeah. thousands of rising events all around the world, which really kind of indicated how, how committed people are to ending violence against women and girls and what they were going to do to engage and contribute to ending that. So that was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So it became deeper in the second year in 2014 because then there was a theme and the theme was justice because of the rampant impunity that's yeah. going on all around the world which is escalating the violence and that so even more groups join and what we saw uh, last year or this year was really that the grassroots led it and there were really creative, audacious ways of expressing people's mm -hmm. indignation and people's, you know, um, intolerance already of, of the violence that's happening. Yeah. So, so, so this year, um, it's already going to escalate again into another theme because it's, it, it almost feels like an unstoppable energy. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, movements are like that. You know, you don't know if they're going to last or then the second year. But the first year, everybody asked, like, why dance? Like, why dance? Like, you know, it, you're, you seem to be like advocating a very serious issue when dance doesn't feel like a serious action. And all of us would say, you know, first of all, when a woman is raped or battered or economically exploited when she becomes hungry and is forced to sell her body and, and all the forms of violence that are done to her, it's her body that gets caged, right? So it's her body that gets oppressed. So dance is such a, not just a symbolic, but a physical release of that, that encagement, that, 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 you know, something that's caging and oppressing her. So survivors all around the world danced mm -hmm. to really kind of gain their power back. But the second reason is also that dancing is alive. It's really a force and, and it's almost unstoppable. Like when people see it, it's like they feel drawn to it. Yes. It's an amazing and, it, and it's collective. Right. It's not something you just do individually. You know, I think in this day and age now, we get so conditioned that it's very individualistic. It's me, me, me. Mm -hmm. But dance is such a collective action. Universal and in that language. collective energy, there's so much power there. Yeah. And, and, and really capacity to change things. Yeah. And what Eve Ensler said about this, she said, we've all learned to be so well behaved and polite. We should be hysterical. Yes. And she's saying absolutely. about this issue, we really yes. should speak up. Yes, yes. And and really what, what it needs to be is that we need to express that rage. You know, right. when when because you know i think our biggest enemy um with social injustices is apathy mm -hmm. you know and i think when you express your rage about things or your yeah. celebration of things yeah. then you're alive and you're connected and you have the ability to then touch other people as well that's right so i think that's the space we have to be in yeah well so much passion for this no wonder you left your post in london you were teaching <laughs> yes. for about five years when you had to leave mm -hmm. to to mm -hmm. do this to be here yeah, right. well, I chose, well, you know, teaching in London was like an amazing, amazing experience because, you know, of course, my past is, is theater yeah. and it'll always live, of course, in the, the deepest part of my heart. But you really come to a point in your life because I'm